Um, welcome to the inaugural lecture of the Jewish Ukraine series that the Jewish Studies Program at the University of Kentucky is sponsoring this semester. My name is Sheila Jelen, and I am director of the Jewish Studies Program here. Um, when I conceived this series, I was responding to a unique experience that I was having as a scholar of Hebrew literature from the turn of the 20th century. The literature which I focused upon for much of the beginning of my career was a literature from Eastern Europe, a literature written in Hebrew and in Yiddish in cities such as Odessa and Kiev. Indeed, the center of modern Hebrew literature was in Odessa, with figures such as Mendela, Mohir Sfarim, and Chaim Nachman Bialik gathering their acolytes around them there for a good many years at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. As the current war in Ukraine unfolded, I was hearing the names of cities and regions that were familiar to me from the past, and I was struck by the way I always thought of those cities in the past, but never in the present. The Hebrew writer David Grossman, in an essay called Stories That Have Read Me, talks about the role of the Russian Jewish author Shalom Aleichem in his conception of Eastern Europe throughout his childhood as a first generation Israeli born to European parents in Jerusalem. He tells us that he saw all the places and landscapes described by Shalom Aleichem as existing simultaneously in time with his own experience in early Israel. But one day during a Holocaust remembrance ritual, Grossman realized that the places described by Shalom Aleichem no longer existed, that they had been snuffed out. I thought that way too about the works of Devorah Baron, um, about whom I wrote my first book. The places she represented were long gone. But as I was reading newspaper articles about the war in Ukraine, I realized that while much of the Jewish life as it was known to the early Hebrew writers was no longer, the places still existed and people still inhabited them, some of them even Jews. I wanted to start thinking about Jewish Ukraine in a new light, a present light. So it is a great privilege to introduce Dr. Marina Bellina, who will help us begin the conversation this semester about Jewish Ukraine. Dr. Bellina is Isaac Funk Professor Emerita and Professor of Russian Studies at Illinois Wesleyan University. Her scholarship focuses on historical and theoretical aspects of 20th century Russian children's literature. She is the author of numerous articles in English, German, and Russian. She served as editor and co-editor of 12 volumes, most recently, The Pedagogy of Images, Depicting Communism for Children, and Hans Christian Andersen and Russia. Her new co-edited volume, Historical and Cultural Transformations of Russian Childhood, Myths and Realities, appeared from Rutledge in November 2023. Dr. Bellina is the recipient of national and international grants, among them the Distinguished Scholar Award from the American Association of Children's Literature, the Kennan Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center, Austrian Ministry of Culture and Literature, and German Academic Exchange. As a guest professor, she has taught at the University of Nottingham, the University of Salzburg, the University of Hamburg, and the University of Hawaii, Manoa. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Marina Bellina, who will speak on the subject of history as his story, Anatoly Kuznetsov's Babiar as Bildungsroman. Take it away. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sal. Uh, thank you for such a generous introduction, um, and uh, I am very honored to begin those series. So although I am going to talk about the book written in Russian, however, this book was a milestone and it opened um, the whole row of poetry and prose that would involve uh, the history of Russian Jewry and the history of Russian Jewry in particular in Ukraine. Um, I would like to begin my presentation today with a little historical background that will help us in our conversation. Let's start with how the Russian Empire accumulated such a large Jewish population. By the end of the 19th century, there were almost 5 million Jews living in the Russian Empire. But it was not the Jews who chose this territory for themselves, but rather the empire that came to Jews who had been living in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth since the 15th century. 
As a result of the wars batched with Poland by Russia, Sweden, Turkey, and later Prussia and Austria, by the end of the 18th century, more than half a million Jews found themselves on the territory of the Russian Empire. For them, according to the decree of Catherine the Great, a pale settlement was created, which implied serious restrictions in movement. Jews were not allowed to live outside their allotted places of 15 provinces of the empire. Um, uh, they were not uh, allowed to live in the capital cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And mainly, as you can see from this map, the territory includes Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. The restrictions extended to the professional activities. The Jewish, Jewish population was excluded from agrarian activities. The percentage norm in education in the educational institutions, 3% for the capital city universities like Moscow and St. Petersburg and 5% for others, 5% um, from the total number of students restricted education. There were several ways out of such a difficult situation for the Jews either conversion, often purely formal, or immigration, or withdrawal into revolutionary struggle against the existing regime. Uh, one of such events was the assassination of the Tsar Alexander II in 1881. There were several Jewish uh, students in the terrorist group. One of them is Hesed Helfman, as you can see here, uh, who actually died in prison. And it was this fact that became the legitimate basis of the network of pogroms that covered Russian empire from uh, 1881 onwards. There were the first pogroms, as you can see, Kiev, Elizabeth Grad is involved, Balta and the city of Odessa. And later, uh, those red dots indicate all the areas where the pogroms took place. Um, the Pale of Settlement was already abolished in the February Revolution of 1917, and the Jewish population, always highly mobile, moved into the cities and industrial centers of the former empire. Jewish cultural life was very active. Jewish theaters were organized in Moscow and major cities, where plays were performed in Yiddish. And the Jewish Yiddish press was active in both poetry and prose during the 1920s and early 1930s. Hebrew was considered to be the language of religion that was censored and abolished. And Yiddish, as Lenin indicated, that it was the language of the working class. So here it was um, uh, the language that uh, was the language of numerous Jewish publications and the plays. Um, cultural and linguistic assimilation was taking its toll, and by 1937, many of the cultural institutions were closed as unnecessary. It was also the political implication of it. Nevertheless, the beginning of the Great Patriotic War, which was the war, the name of the war within the Russian history, it was not the uh, Second World War II, it was the Great Patriotic War that started on June 22nd, 1945, and ended on May 9th, not 8th, May 9th, 1945. Uh, but the beginning of the Great Patriotic War was approached by Jewish citizens of the Soviet country as full members of the Soviet society. The experience of the Shoah, I am using rather this word than the Holocaust, was not incorporated into the public memory of Soviet Russia, neither as a domestic tragedy, uh, nor a universal one. However, the very search for ways to express this experience takes a stand against the statement made by Elie Wiesel in 1966 when he called Soviet Jews Jews of silence. As a first attempt to create a discourse of public memory of the Shoah, I would point to the war poetry of 1941-45. The leading poets of this period who addressed uh, the theme of Shoah were Ilya Edinburgh, over here, uh, it was Lev Ozerov and Pavel Antakolsky. 
There is no doubt that their poetry dated back to the war years was an unconventional attempt to create a public memory of the victims of the Shoah. In these attempts, we see a peculiar combination of Jewish and Soviet, which in principle runs counter to the stereotypical view of many Holocaust scholars about the incompatibility of these two concepts. A supporting element um, uh, in the creation of the discourse of public memory in wartime poetry is the special position of the narrator. He, mainly male authors, is a witness to what he has seen. This purely personal view makes the author not a passive observer, but an active conductor of what he sees, a link between the reader and the numerous victims whose suffering the poet seeks to articulate. All the above poets were of Jewish descent, but they were Soviet Jews who long ago had severe ties with the shtetls from which their ancestors came. Here is what Ilya Irinburg Um, uh, said about himself in his speech at a rally in Moscow on August 24th, 1941. My mother tongue is Russian. I am a Russian writer. Like all Russians, I am now defending my homeland. But the Hitlerites have reminded me of something else. My mother's name was Hannah. I am a Jew. I say this with pride. Hitler hates us more than anything, and this adorns us. This duality of identity, um, uh, the scholar of uh, Jewish culture, Maxim Schreier, calls it double perspective. Seeing the war as both as Soviet and Jewish also produces a specific vision. The Jew is only one of the victims of Nazism, against which the entire Soviet people, of which the Jews are a part, are fighting. Thus, any discussion of the Shoah was blocked at the level of ideology and controlled by a single rule. Do not divide the dead. Many of today's researchers of the Shoah phenomenon in Russia, Richard Sheldon, for example, tend to see this position of the Soviet ideological apparatus as preparation for the processes against cosmopolitans, which began back in late 1946 and 1947, and the following period of what Jeffrey Hicks calls Black Years of Soviet Jewry, 1948-1952. Thus, as... Um, the arrest and destruction of the Jewish anti-fascist committee. Um, they were all, uh, only one of them survived. Uh, this is Lina Stern. It's a very interesting article coming up in Slavic Review about her. She was working on issues of longevity, and this is why Stalin supposedly uh, saved her from annihilation. Um as well as um, Salamon Michols, the director of the uh, Gasset Jewish Theater, who became the uh, chair of that committee and who accumulated, I mean, he collected enormous amount of sums traveling to America, meeting with Einstein, meeting with uh, leaders um, in the States and in Mexico and in Great Britain, collecting money in support of the Soviet army. The black book um, uh, that's supposed to be edited by Ilya Irinburg and Vasily Grossman was totally put, um, um, well, I wouldn't say destroyed, but in, in a way it was destroyed, you know, <clears throat> after the work was never published. Part of it was published in the States in 1947. And in Russia, the black book, Chorna Kniga, was published only in 2015. And the money for the publication was collection through internet, not the state. Um, the prose work of non-Jewish writers was also very influential on creating this, um, uh, this image uh, of the Jewish destruction. And a uh, Russian writer like Konstantin Simonov, who was uh, actually asked to put down 
um, his recollections of the special executions of Jews. He didn't do it, and he was talking about the extermination camp in Treblinka. So, and he published uh, his publication supposed to be included into the Black Book as well. Another very important uh, work and prose was Vasily Grossman's, one of the editors of the Black Book, uh, The Hell of Treblinka, and that um, narrative, that story, uh, worked as part of the documents at the Nuremberg uh, trial. Uh, this is practically the end of um, the Jewish Renaissance, if you could call it. You know, and here you see the leading authorities uh, in Jewish literature, in Jewish science. Um, it is the document um, of uh, August 12th, 1952, which became known in uh, Russian and Jewish history as the Night of the Dead Poets. Only four of those people were the actual poets. Uh, the rest were just the Jewish intellectuals. Um, and with this background and with this baggage, uh, we are coming to the new period um, in Russian um, Soviet history, uh, in, in Russian Soviet history about the Shoah, and it is the thought period, T-H-A-W, uh, uh, that is connected with Khrushchev and the liberation period in the Russian history of the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 1960s. One of the events of this um uh, remarkable events for the Jewish history um, in uh, Soviet Union was the publication of the collection of Sholem Aleichem and his multi-volume edition that appeared in Russian translation. Another one was the Diary of Anne Frank that was translated uh, and published in 1960s. 1961, uh, in August 1961, the first issue of Sovietische Heimland in Yiddish was published, in which, naturally, memoirs and artistic texts about the Shoah began to appear. That same year, um, 1961, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, one of the leading Russian poets, uh, published his poem, Babi Yar. It was written, and the first reading of which took place in September in Moscow at the Polytechnic Institute, the main arena of the Thor Poetic Experiments. The reading was timed to coincide with the 20th anniversary of Babi Yar tragedy. I am pronouncing in the Russian way, using the title of the book. However, I would like to make you aware that um, nowadays, uh, the Ukrainian version and Ukrainian pronunciation of this region is um, uh, um, came into practice and discourse, so it is called Babin Yar. Um, 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 actually, in 1963, the memoirs of Masha Renikaite, a prisoner of the First, the Vilnius Ghetto and then the succession of labor camps were first published in Lithuanian and then in Russian in 1965. All these events lead us to the subject of my talk today, the novel by Anatoly Kuznetsov, Babi Yar, a document in the form of a novel. Uh, this is the monument that was finally built in Babin Yar, um, in 1976, and this monument doesn't have the word Jew on it. So no Jewish victims, all the victims were the Soviet people. On September 29, 2009, a monument to Anatoly Kuznetsov, author of the documentary novel Babi Yar, which caused an international sensation upon its publication in 1966, was unveiled at the intersection uh, of Petropavlivska and Kurilska Street in Kiev, Ukraine. The monument's opening date was set to coincide with the anniversary of one of the most horrific events in the history of the Holocaust by bullet the mass shooting of the Jewish population of Kiev organized by the Nazis on September 29, 
uh, 30th, 1941. On those days, 33,771 Jews were shot at Babi Yar, a ravine on the city's outskirts. Throughout the Nazi occupation, which lasted from September 19, 1941 until November 6, uh, 1943, Babi Yar remained an execution site, predominantly for the Jewish population of Kiev and surrounding towns, and for the Soviet POWs and captured partisans. The monument's unveiling marked another memorable date. Um, what would have been the 80th birthday of Anatoly Kuznetsov, 1929-1979, the author of the first novel published in the post-war USSR to describe the tragedy of the country's Jewish population, a topic otherwise scrupulously avoided in Soviet media. This document in form of a novel, as the author defined his book, genre, is written in the first person. The protagonist narrator is at the outset 12 years old, as was Kuznetsov when Kiev was seized by the German, German forces in 1941. And so the novel is not only a document, but also an autobiographical text, part of which is the personal story of the struggle to get the novel itself published. The child's story as aspect of the work is mirrored in the design of the monument. Let me just go back to it. Uh, mm, which conveys the autobiographical nature of the text. A boy standing before a wall on which the order of the German occupation authorities is posted. This sculptural installation directly illustrates the novel's key event. The order is for all Jews to come to a place of assembly on September 29, 1941, with luggage. The young Ukrainian sculptor Volodymyr Zhuravel chose this episode emphasizing the importance of the teenager as a witness of history. The complex and turbulent history of the novel's publication um, and the complicated life of its creator has been uh, described more than once in Western criticism. In its Soviet edition, the novel underwent severe censorship, but was nevertheless published in 1966 by the literary magazine Yunist and a year later by the publishing house Maladeya Gvardi as a standalone in every sense of this word volume. In 1969, during a visit to the United Kingdom, ostensibly to gather material for a new book about revolutionary history, Kuznetsov formally defected, becoming a nevozvrashenets, a non-returner. He managed to bring along the microfilms with the full uncensored uh, version of the novel. With the author's additions under this pseudonym of A. Anatoly, Babi Yar was reprinted in 1970 by the emigre publishing house Basiev. The same year, the English translation by David Floyd was published in London and New York. For the new edition, Kuznetsov restored parts of his text that had been removed by the Soviet censors and added explanatory material that had occurred to him after the book's Soviet publication. Thus, he created a kind of three-part narrative. I want you to see the page. Three-part narrative, which was also reflected graphically. The Soviet publication in plain text, the restored censor, uh, censored cuts in bold, and the text added later in square brackets. The complex textual arrangement complicates the book's interpretation as various critics have found correspondingly various narrative features to focus on. The American reviewer, Zoya Vatnikova Prizel, read, read Kuznetsov's novel as a new syncretic form of memoir that adds, quote, certain new structural elements to the genre of memoir literature, the documentary nature of living and uh, written testimony and personal authorial expression, end quote. 
Another American scholar and translator, Richard Sheldon, dismisses the multi-layered narrative nature of the narrative, stating that um, the, quote, weakest moments occur at those junctions where Kuznetsov interrupts the narrative with his adult um, additions, end quote. James Young focuses on Kuznetsov as author witness, viewing testimony as a main function of Kuznetsov's book. Uh, the French scholar uh, Asya Kavrigina adheres to the same position characterizing the novel as a literary testimonial. As Kavrigina puts it, quote, the 20th century gave birth to a new genre of literature or anti-literature, the literary testimonial, a documentary testimonial that has a literary intent and is written in the form of a literary work, end quote. Kavrikina believes that the literary testimonial is a special mode of narrative that is limited in its freedom of fictionalization by the very reality that such a text broadcasts and which it, uh, quote, seeks to convey to reproduce, but by no means to distort, end quote. However, as the concerns of these perspectives uh, is the syncretic Form, the polyphonic composition of the novel and testimony, the voice of the narrator, the 12 year old boy who lives two years of his life in the new reality of German occupation, does not get sufficient attention. During these two years, the protagonist narrator's identity was formed and his agency defined. The documentary nature of the novel lies not only in what the author sees, which aspect of the war and occupation he reflects on in his narrative, but also in how he sees the events taking place. First and foremost, Kuznetsov's novel gives its reader a quite unusual perspective on the war, the tragedy of which is restored through the experience of a child's maturation. In my view, then, the function of witnessing uh, competes for prominence with the story of personal formation amidst the destruction of all human values, including that of life itself. To, re <clears throat> Excuse me. to recover the voice of this young survivor, I will consider Kuznetsov's novel as Bildungsroman. Um, a novel of education. The main task of the novel of education is tracing a human being emergence of how he is essential becoming. This is one of the main features of Kuznetsov's text, which represents the historical atrocity through a child's cognitive experience. I believe that this perspective can help to keep the text from disintegrating into a complex of unequal and variously connected parts. This passive witnessing of the Holocaust atrocities is not only a destructive experience of the teenage character. Rather, the text presents the assault on the moral values of his pre-war life at all stages of his inclusion into the new reality of Nazi occupation, his initiation into this new social order. This is when young Anatoly most acutely feels the break with his pre-war reality. This new reality demands action and one must survive. So the maturation stage begins much earlier than the teenager is ready for it. Antoine Berman defines uh, Bildung, a German word for education, as both a process and a result. Quote, through building an individual, a people, a nation, but also a language, a literature, a work of art in uh, general are formed and thus acquire a form. Building is a process of self-formation, end quote. Describing his childhood during the occupation of Kiev, Kuznetsov paints the picture of an anti-building, where the harsh reality of life and the routine of death deprive a teenager of a sense of the future. This is Anatoly Kuznetsov's own special Babi Yar, only seen when the Bildungsroman paradigm is superimposed over his experience. The focus of an, the narrator's witnessing mission is repeatedly emphasized. For example, at the very start of the novel, in describing his writing intentions, the author states, quote, I'm writing this as if I were given 
evidence under oath in the very highest court. And I'm ready to answer for every single word. This book records only the truth as it really happened, capitalized, end quote. Finishing the novel with the post-war destruction of Babi Yar, a dam was built, the ravine filled by water. The writer prepares his readers for the events of 1961 when due to spring rain, the dam broke and, quote, a wall of liquid mud 30 feet high poured out of the mouth of Babi Yar with the speed of an express train, end quote. The author did not directly witness this event. He learned about them from accident, uh, accidental eyewitnesses who survived since the Soviet authorities, as with the Holocaust events themselves, strenuously hushed up both the number of victims and the very fact of the flooding. Nevertheless, this episode and the last in 1962, a road was built over the filled in ravine, a create a special framework that combines both the experiences of the author, the internal focus as a child protagonist and observer of the novel events, an external voice, an older narrator with a larger vision who knows more than his young protagonist. Our understanding of the autobiographical self's maturation, this central element of the novel of education, can be traced in almost linear temporal narrative from the beginning of the occupation, September 19, 1941, to its end, November 6, 1943. It can be traced through the combination of the text officially printed in the Soviet Union and the section that were previously rejected by the censorship. Kuznetsov records even the slightest changes in the mind and character of his self, engaging all categories of his perception, from the olfactory and sonic to the haptic and optic. As early as the introductory chapter of the novel, which is called Ashes, we witness the attempt to activate every element of human perception connected to the tragedy. The memory of Babi Yaravin has clear geographical coordinates, Lukyanovka, Kurinovka, and Syrians. The place was has a very specific smell of, quote, heavy, oily column of smoke that rose over the ravine during the last three weeks of the occupation. And that, from that point, was imprinted into the boy's olfactory memory. The place is associated with the sound of machine gun fire at the certain intervals. Ta-ta-ta. Ta -ta. However, along with fear, the young character is possessing by an understandable curiosity. It was hardly surprising that, this is the quote, when it was all over, despite our fear of mines, I went along with friend to see what was left behind, end quote. The boy arrives at the site of the shooting of the Jews, and his optics are already tuned to a particular focus of vision, but he finds himself unprepared to what he must experience. At first, his eyes pick up the ordinary. There are images of an old man crossing the ravine, the three boys who are not only herding goats, but also intent, intently searching for gold in the dust of the ravine. It takes Anatoly, the character, time to express his attitude toward what he sees. But what transfers the optic experience uh, transfers this optical experience into a category of horror is the deployment of another perceptual category, haptic or tactile contact with the remains. The reader does not know how the rest of the narrative will unfold, but a tactile sensation completes this first experience of place of human tragedy, preparing us for what is to come. Uh, I have a bigger quote here, so uh, I will start and then you will see the quote on my slide. The riverboat, uh, excuse me, the riverbed was of good coarse sand, but now, for some reason or other, the scent was mixed with little white stone. And that's the quote begins. I bent down and picked one of them up to look at it uh, more closely. It was a small piece of bone, about as big as a fingernail. And it was charred on one side and white on the other. Suddenly, we realized 
we were walking on human ashes. This event of touching human ashes and bones becomes the impetus for the story. The impulse for writing that is, is not what the autobiographical character sees, but what he feels as he, as he walks on human ashes and touches human bones. One's haptic experience, transmitting and understanding information through touch, dominates all other forms of perception in the situation. For a boy who survived the fear during the occupation when he saw death daily, touching the uncanny becomes a more powerful experience than all other forms of the per perceptual cognition of tragedy. Thus, uh, what he sees, human bones and ashes, acquires additional dimensions, combining in one narrative space the childlike learning about the world through touch and literally touching the oblivion of death. Through the through pictorial image, imagery of this new reality, that of the occupation, a new phase in boys' education begins. Anatoly is not merely a beholder, but also an active participant of this new world. An important moment in his initiation is the robbery of the local stores in which he quite deliberately takes part. Remember, he was 12. I found people looting a large footwear shop. The shop windows had been shattered and there were grown-ups inside it, elbowing each other out of the way and tramping the broken glass underfoot. I dashed in after them, just in time to see them get their hands on some boxes of shoes and galoshes. My God, what fabulous goods for those days, end quote. To his disappointment, the boy is elate. Uh, to the scene of looting. So he gets only a kerosene lamp and the weight uh, from a scale. But the vignette, however, changes the nature of his view of himself. Instead of progressing horizontally to a new world of permissiveness, the boy suddenly recalls the tenets of pre-war behavior that his God-fearing grandmother taught him. Quote, I was ready to burst into tears. I have never been greedy. I was grandma's well-behaved, polite little boy. Yet, all of a sudden, this craze for loot had come over me like a hot avalanche, and I felt a tightness in my throat from greed and excitement, end quote. This next key moment in such a dynamic occurs when Anatoly sees the order the new German administration requires local Jews to report to assembly point on September 29th. Rumors of Jewish deportation begin to circulate among the locals. The first act of bewilderment must tell his friend, the half-Jewish Shurka Matzah, uh, leave too, is followed by an unexpected outbreak of anti-Semitism. Um, uh, ignore the first one, so go to the second quote. Um, then suddenly, to my surprise, sort of spontaneously, I began to talk to myself in my grandfather's words with that same intonation and malice. So what? Let them go off to their Palestine. They were grown fat enough here. This is the Ukraine. Look how they were multiplied and spread out all over the place like fleas. End quote. The next morning begins with the desire to see everything with his own eyes. This is here my first quote. I mean, I should have changed them places. Sorry. Uh, he does not apologize for his behavior. He has no remorse for thinking badly about Shurka Matsa the day before. Understanding the horror of what is happening comes at the optic level. The scene that unfolds before his eyes fills the teenager with the fear in incomprehension. The narrator does not try to talk about other emotions, empathy, sympathy, that do not yet come to him. Only when Tolle sees the exodus of Kiev's Jews on their way to Babi Yar, with their howling children, their old and sick, some of them weeping, others swearing at each other, quote, he is he feeling with compassion and sympathy 
immediately, and I did it at the very end of this quote, immediately dropping completely his anti-Semitism of the previous days. However, as the story progresses and the autobiographical character's experience of war and occupation grows, there's less and less room for such self-judgment. Anatoly does not yet know what awaits the Jews at Babi Yar, but he sees and hears the reaction of people watching the exodus. Uh, here, uh, with this quote, I kept the bolt, and you remember that the bolt was, uh, the bolt in the narrative was what was taken by the Soviet censorship. Um, the sympathy and anger of the crowd, as well as the remarks and glances of the bystanders merged into one optic sonic image, so clearly imprinted in Anatoly's memory. For two years, he saw murder, theft, hatred, and lack of compassion. Babi Yar documents this way in which the world, with its constant violation of human morality, hardens the immature soul of the child. The adults do not protect, uh, not try to protect him. His own grandfather decides the constant sound of gunshots coming from Babi Yar. Quote, do you know what? He says to the child. They are not deporting them. They are shooting them. The sonic sign of massacre haunts the autobiographical character uh, throughout the narrative in exactly the same sequence. Ta-ta-ta. Ta-ta. Thus, the optic and sonic create a unified image of destruction that will be imprinted in the memory of the teenager, rendering Babi Yar sensorily perpetual in Kuznetsov's adult mind. Each new invitation of the boy into adulthood is accompanied by new forms of perception. The haptic and olfactory sensations combine in his new experience of working for the sausage maker Zikstiryov, uh, describing in the chapter how to turn a horse into sausages. Zikstiryov, the owner of the sausage shops, gives Anatoly good food, being quite generous with his little helper, uh, though completely unconcerned about his emotional trauma on seeing how horses are methodically killed and butchered. Throughout the episode, Kuznetsov contrasts the cleanness of the house and its master's good spirit, quote, he was in the best of humors and full of energy, end quote, and the streams of blood that the boy must collect in special tubes for blood sausage. The narrator gives a detailed account of his younger self's participation in the process from the binding the horse's legs to the axe blow to its skull. He sees what that... Quote, old Gray, who had apparently become accustomed to everything in this life, stood quiet, offering no resistance, end quote. Kuznetsov, the narrator, represents death and murder as mundane work, in which blood it turned into blood sausage. Critics of the novel often know that the author turned the narration of scenes of the mass murder to, of Jews and POWs over to two Babi Yar real survivors, Dina Pronicheva and Vladimir Davidov. Um, this is if he was even accused of um, of um, uh, violating uh, violating copyrights. However, this chapter shows the ordinary plant process of destroying life, even if not human and may be important to understand all the damage that the war wrecks on the yours. Anatoly is never hungry in Dikteryov's house, but his fingers are constantly bruised. The salt in which he must dip pieces of meat keeps these cuts from healing. Thus, his hands become a constant reminder of the death surrounding him. The teenager um, is immersed in the smell of blood, old and fresh. Quote, you couldn't breathe. There seemed no end to the sausage skin, end quote. The smell and touch of bloody meat creates an olfactory and tactile uh, hell for the boy, who is now 13 year old. Day after day, he relieves this hell, which emotionally devastates him. 
This is the price of his survival. The boy is diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis and his mother having uh, given up the last valuable possessions in the house, sends him to the village of Rikin to stay with a woman who remains in the author's memory as Gonchirenka. The woman is feeding Tola, but honey becomes the main delicacy and medicine, and it is always rationed. Left alone, the teenager, left, led by the smell of honey, climbs into the closet and finding a pot of honey there, begins to eat it with his fingers. Touching honey and licking it off his fingers gives him physical pleasure. Theft of forbidden sweets is a frequent topic in stories of childhood, but it takes a new twist in this narrative, forming the foundation of an ideological credo. Quote, I had to eat honey so as not to have tuberculosis, to take care of myself, and I wanted to devour as much as I like. Because in its glorious stone crusher, that only way to save your skin was to seize the moment when things went your way, to grab everything you could lay your hands on that had been left unlocked and that hadn't been noticed, to sleep between people's legs and snatch things out of their hands so long as you survive. I'll take what I can, and I survive in spite of everything, end quote. Kuznetsov is not afraid to show how a de de human hum humanization environment where stealing and killing are routine influences in adolescent consciousness. He shows how this new human is formed with a new kind of ethics, with a resolute desire to survive and a readiness to transgress previous moral dictates. Early in the novel, Kuznetsov quotes his protagonist's thoughts about reality being all Babi Yar. I realized that my grandfather, that great admirer of Germans, was a fool. Uh, that there is in this world neither brains, no goodness, no good sense, but only brute force, bloodshed, starvation, death. The world was just one big Bobby Yar, end quote. Kuznetsov thus traces with accuracy and candor the transmission of an open, kind child into a war hatred, premature, matured human being with education in quotation marks. Um, has taken place in an atmosphere of blood, hardship, and mass deaths. An upbringing uh, amidst war cannot enable the soul, as Kuznetsov does not hesitate to remark. The autobiography of the writer's wartime childhood not only consists of the atrocity images etched into his memory, but also represents a history of personal trauma hidden under the plethora of documents and facts. Analyzing Kuznetsov's text as an autobiographical novel of education is in no way detracts from its significance as a witness account of the Holocaust. Rather, it adds a new dimension to its testimonial function. We see how, as experience of war progresses, a teenager's view of the world changes. His understanding of good and evil is endangered. The historical events against which Anatoly's life takes place are presented as a matter of personal experience. This is a private privatization of history, which involves, conversely, quote, turning private lives into public texts, end quote. It is this public perception of private experience that makes this autobiographical self of the novel a war witness, whereas he is, in fact, first and foremost, a war victim, whose voice in the book is practically drowned out by this very history. As uh, Lee Gilmore puts it in his study of trauma and life writing, quote, life writing about trauma moves, moves personal experience onto the historical stage. It provides a way to reconceive the relationship between private and public, and it produces a counter discourse in the historical muting or erasure of the kinds of violence that have been regarded as violating dominant cultural norms and uh, narratives. 
according to recollection of his contemporaries, Kuznetsov was a complex man with his own difficult life experiences. In his defection and early death, he was only 50 when he died of a heart attack in London, attested to deep personal problems. The image of a teenager who, albeit surviving, is perpetually hungry and all-timely broken was nothing like the widely cultivated Soviet images of heroes of the Great Patriotic War or the heroes of Konstantin Simonov's war epics. Perhaps only the so-called lieutenant's prose of his contemporaries, Viktor Nikrasov and Konstantin Vorobyov, comes close in the frankness to the um, unvarnished history of war witnessed by young Anatoly. According to Jacques Derrida, quote, the autobiography becomes effective not at the moment it takes place, but only when the message is received by other peers. The receiving ear must be perceived both as the ear of the other or the ear of the autobiographical subject. In the novel, Kuznetsov voices the horrific experience of war, not only for the reader, but also for himself. The boy's experience sharpened vision moves not just horizontally registering the war in ever more detail, but also vertically, deep into himself, to find the still uncorrupted moral vitality the writer seems to have so needed. This is what Babi Yar, uh, what makes Babi Yar into a testimonial of history with a capital, with the capital H. This book stand alone for several years until it was um, it was discussed. It was actually it was taken out of circulation immediately after his. Uh, defection, and um, it is reprinted now both in Russian and in English, and this book remained one of the best um, uh, the best works of that particular period that could wake up uh, the population of the Soviet Union to the tragedy that this child has recorded in such a meticulous way. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I want to encourage you all um, to put your questions into the Q and A um, section of the of the webinar. Um, you may ask questions of our speaker. While you prepare your questions and put them in, I have a few questions of my own to mm -hmm. get us. So, um, first of all, I was really fascinated by um, your formulation of um, the transitional point between him become being a passive observer and then turning into an active participant. Um, that he moved from being just a beholder <laughs> to being some kind of a witness, right? Um, and also actually, you know, looting and, and getting involved in, in that. Um, so it, it, your, your, your framing of that really helped me understand one of my favorite stories, um, which is a story by Saul Bellow called Something to Remember Me By. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's this very interesting story where it's it's kind of like an ethical will, right? Where he's he's speaking to a grandson and he's talking about one day in his life um, when he was a teenage boy. He's about seventeen years old in the story, I think. Um, and the one of my favorite lines in the story is at the beginning of the story when he's delivering flowers. He lives in Chicago and it's a very cold day like today, and he has to tra traipse across town from. Um, from the west side to the north side in order to deliver flowers for a florist that he works for. Um, and he delivers flowers to uh, the house of, of a girl who has died. Mm -hmm. So it's a girl his age. She has died. She's laying in an open coffin. He's a Jewish boy. Jews don't really, traditional Jews don't really do open coffins. He's never seen a dead body before. And he comes face to face 
with a dead girl exactly his age. And the line reads, I saw and I saw and I saw, right? Mm -hmm. So I just love that line because he doesn't even know how to react. He, he, he just sees and he sees and he sees. And then in the course of the story, he becomes an unwilling actor in um, his own awakening to his sexuality, awakening to the death of his mother, who's at home dying while he's going around town um, doing crazy stuff. Um, so I feel like your presentation about the Anatoly in the book, the protagonist of the book, really helped me to understand what Saul Bellow is doing. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, another question um, that I wanted to ask um, has to do with the, the date of publication of the poem Babiar uh, mm -hmm. by um, Yevgeny uh, Yavtushenko. Mm -hmm. So you said it was published in 1961. Mm -hmm. and it was read in 1961. <laughs> read. Oh, so he read mm -hmm. it in public. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. wondering if there's any correspondence between that event and mm -hmm. the Eichmann trial, um, which also took place in 1961, um, sort of the birth of the voice of the victim, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's my second question. It's a question. Mm -hmm. the first more of a comment and then my third question and then I'll stop because I see there are questions coming into the Q&A um, mm -hmm. has to do with the representation of Ukrainian children um, during this war right um, mm -hmm. the, it, uh, I think I don't know maybe two months ago there was um, the Sunday Times the Sunday New York Times magazine mm -hmm. had a whole feature on Ukrainian children and their experiences being separated from their parents um sent off to you know camps or whatever um un unwillingly right for mm -hmm. months um and but was interesting what was interesting about the article was that it was in the voices of the children right so mm -hmm. it was they were telling about their experiences as ukrainian children being taken into russia and and mm -hmm. and separated from their parents so i was i was i was curious um as to whether you've thought about that in terms of your thesis here, mm -hmm. right, um, of th this Ukrainian child, right, um, who becomes a witness and becomes a victim through his witnessing, through the interruption of his building, right, um, whether you made any connections between between those. Mm -hmm. So let me start with the last question, and then I go to the second one, okay? <laughs> and thank you for your comment. So, um, um I recently had an experience, you know, that um, oh, I thought I'm old enough that it is not going to affect me <laughs> or change me. So, but I had an experience. I belong to the German group of, um, it is called Kinder Literarisches Colloquium. So there are the scholars of German, um, of, uh, not German, of uh, children's literature that get together on the internet. So we get together several times a year, so we discuss things. And um, I was asked to translate uh, a Ukrainian librarian, children's literature, li literature librarian, you know, and um, um, and uh, to be honest, I was crying during her translation. She was crying and I was crying. I mean, we connected on this. So because um, she was telling stories about what they do for children, how they organize those places of um, entertainment and uh, safe spaces so for the children. And she was also sharing new stories that were published by the contemporary Ukrainian writers to help children survive. So, for example, the uh, most favorite stories are about a dog and the dog's name is Pistol. Mm. Yeah. So, and the dog explains to children how not to touch um, whatever they find around, laying around them. So, what is dangerous, what is not dangerous, you know. And the reason for my tears, honestly, was that we are in the 21st century, you know, and we still need to learn to teach our children, you know, about the dangers of the war. So, um, although I admire the work of these people, um, of course any such event changes children's perception of the world. And of course, to me, the story that is related through the eyes of a 
teenager is evidence of how damaged a child is through the war experience. And the damage doesn't go away. It stays with you. So, and this is, to me, this is very important. And if the children, and the children definitely, I mean, this librarian from the city of Kherson, so she was showing the pictures that the children drew, and, and she was sharing um, the experiences the children have. So, and it will be a very difficult uh, generation that is going to grow up uh, in the contemporary world. It is related to any type of experience of the war. When I'm, for example, when I'm thinking about Israel right now, I mean, I'm also thinking about the generation that grows up on both sides, you know, grows up with the experience of the war. This is the most horrific experience, moral experience for me. The changes in morality, that changes the very, very, very essence of a child. Yeah, and it even you know affects the children who aren't directly involved in the war because it's it's in the media and exactly and it, becomes, and, it becomes normalized you know yeah. and especially uh, now when you with a click of a button on your phone you know you get horrific pictures and you get i mean we are going to deal for years and years and years after all this con conflicts will be resolved i hope it will be in our lifetime so we are going to deal with with the experience of this generation this is why i was going sort of against the grain and <laughs> writing about this novel in a totally different way not only because i'm the children's literature researcher but also also because i uh, truly believe that uh, that that uh, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go away. It stays with you for years and years to come. Your previous question about Eichmann trial. So the 60s were <clears throat> the liberal times for the late 50s and the early 60s, the liberal times in Russia, but not to that degree that the state of Israel was not uh was not being called the zionist state and the, so i don't think that eichmann trial was um was an event that could somehow influence the poem what influenced the poem was yevtushenko's first hand experience he came to kiev to visit his friend Viktor Nikrasov, one of the greatest writers of that time so and um actually the author who really presented the horrors of the war instead of glorification of the war like it used to be in Russia and it still is in Russia. So, and uh, Viktor Nikrasov, who was constantly advocating because it was nothing, totally nothing on this ravine. So no monuments, no nothing until 2011. There were no monuments at all. In 2076, it was a big monument to the heroes of the war uh, without even the word Jewish. Mm -hmm. So the Soviet people. And uh, Nikrasov and Anatoly Kuznetsov both brought, uh, brought uh, Yevtushenko to the ravine. They showed him what was happening and Nikrasov was talking to him about uh, the, the events that he knew from people who lived around and who were the absorbers of this. And that was the appearance of Yevtushenko's poem. He first, as far as I know, but I don't have any documents to support it. And the article is already published. It was a special issue of East European Holocaust Studies on Kuznetsov. Um, so, and according to what I know, it was first read in Kiev to a small group of his um, literati, of his of his uh, colleagues and um, young writers and poets. And then it was published, and it was published, and he got a lot of he got in a lot of trouble with publication of this poem. Mm, I'm sure. Yeah. So we have a few comments um, in the in the Q and A, which I would like to share. go there. Or are you going to read it for me? Yeah. I'll just read it. I'll read a few. Um, so an anonymous guest says mm -hmm. um, that this isn't really a question, just an observation. 
I've been in therapy for trauma for some years now, and a big part of that process is writing and rewriting the narrative of the traumatic events over and over again, essentially until you're desensitized to it. This was a fascinating reframing of that process for me as a function of literary history, oh, not thanks. just an activity that my therapist has me do over and over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting observation. Yeah, this is a very interesting observation. And in uh, literary studies, in literary theory, it is called scriptotherapy. So I mean, uh, an exercise, uh, an exercise of um, this type of experience, and a lot of scriptotherapeutic works became works of literature. Um, I believe that, in a way, that was what formed also Kuznetsov's narrative. Thank you. Yeah, um, Hank Miller says, "Thank you for the fascinating talk." I'm working on a project on Kuznetsov, and I was wondering to oh. what extent. Professor Bellina would see Babi Yar as a rupture or a continuity, <laughs> excuse me, with his earlier official work as a writer oh. of official youth prose, mm -hmm. his less remembered debut continu continuation uh -huh. of a legend. Uh -huh. Is the use of Bildung in Babi Yar a continuation of this? Oh, an ironic comment on it. What are your thoughts? That's a good question. Wow, it's a wonderful question. So, um, well, do we have another hour? <laughs> yeah, actually, please do write to me. So I think I, I can be of help. So um, it is not the continuation of um, Kuznetsov because he departed totally from his previous uh, novel, which was called Всем смертям на as far as I remember that, about a um, human being, a bit about a man who was severely wounded during um, an explosion at the factory, but he, and he lost both arms, but he didn't degenerate. He continues to be a brave Soviet person. I mean, this is sort of in the vein of um, Soviet era heroism. So, and that was his debut. He was also working, uh, Kuznetsov, as a writer for a factory newspaper. He had a very complicated, complicated literary career. You know, he was whew, kissing up to the authorities, pardon my French. So, he was also a very controversial figure because when he finally uh, left, when he became uh, the non-returnee, so he confessed that he was a KGB informant and a lot of his previous uh, friends uh, severed their ties with him. So he was, he was pretty lonely. That was a breakthrough. I believe that at certain point, um, all those feelings, all those experiences, he couldn't bottle them up anymore. Mm. And and that moved him to write this particular work, which I believe to a certain degree was the work of courage. Uh, he was complaining about censorship. He was complaining, well, and he should. I mean, almost half of the book was, if you find, if you take the contemporary edition, you see that almost half of the book is in bold. So a lot was, a lot was taken out. So, but at the same time, um, he was an incredibly talented man, but he remained in the history as the author of one book. And that was a breakthrough on so many different levels, intellectually, historically, personally, um, aesthetically, if you want. So um, he never did anything else. He worked as a um, commentator on uh, Radio Liberty, uh, and that was about it. Yeah, I read um, when I was... Uh preparing myself for this lecture, I read um, an essay which said that um, he never wrote anything. Once he defected, mm -hmm. he had a plan to publish all of his unpublished novels. He defected with them in his jacket, mm -hmm. yes. or mm -hmm. microfilm or mm -hmm. microfilm. Mm -hmm. um, but once he was free and he didn't have to deal with censors and he didn't have to deal with Soviet ideology, he felt like what he had written was irrelevant. Um, so 
it, it's interesting. Um, it, it is and it isn't. Actually, uh, his son, he had a son uh, who was left behind, of course, you know, because he immigrated to Wallen. Um, his son uh, is, uh, was, I don't know the state of this project right now, he was trying to publish his um, radio scripts that he wrote. So maybe we will learn something new about him. So yeah. no, I cannot, cannot promise. So. so our final question is from another anonymous attendee. How can we as educators help children growing up through this sort of thing? Uh, it's a one million dollar question. <laughs> Talking to them, mm -hmm. making them read and and discuss works. You know, um, the society became very pragmatic. You know, I mean, maybe always was, and maybe such a <clears throat> old person as I. <laughs> So hoped for a better a better situation for this new generation that would read um, instead of um, using TikTok to communicate. So, but uh, no criticism. So this is this is just a remark. Um, I think we need to talk. We need to talk to this generation and see um, how uh, they rely. Uh, to the events that are happening around them. Mm -hmm. Because silence breeds, breeds um, trouble. Absolutely. I want to thank you very much for more than welcome time to come and speak with us about your work on, on Kuznetsov. And I just want to um, announce the next several lectures that we will be having in this series. Our next lecture with Sasha Sandorovich of the University of Washington will take place on Wednesday, January 31st from 6 to 7.30, both on Zoom and, if weather permits, um, in the Alumni Gallery at the Young Library. Um, the subject um, of his talk will be How the Soviet Jew Was Made, which is based on his recently published book, on February 21st, we'll hear from Marat Greenberg of Reed College, um, also from six to seven. Oh, there's there's Sasha's book, yes. Mm -hmm. um, our fourth talk will be by Amelia Glazer from UC Davis. Um, and uh, that's on March um, 3rd, I believe. For some reason, I didn't write down the dates. Um, mm -hmm. Or March 6th, actually. And then Raymond DeLuca, um, from our department here at the University of Kentucky will be speaking on April 3rd from six to seven as well. So thank you all for coming. Thank you again to um, Dr. Bellina. Have a wonderful evening and stay thank warm. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you.